the heritage. So I'm going to talk to you today about a thing called the Brecon's Beacons, Brecon Beacons National Park Historic Environment Action Plan. And I will not refer to it as a HEAP, although that obviously is the acronym that, that uh, results. Um, but we do call it the HEAP ourselves. But anyway, it's the BBNP HEAP, or Historic Environment Action Plan. So um, I'll talk to you... Just get, got to get the right buttons here... Um, about the background to how we've come to develop the, the action plan, the process that we've developed to do it, some of the outcomes that we've already um, achieved, and the future, I suppose, as we see it, um, and the sorts of things we're going to, going to do with it. Um, so just some background. I mean, Alan has given you some wonderful uh, information about the geological origins of the park, so I don't need to, to, to tell you anything about that. Uh, the key thing I want to mention, really, uh, in terms of the landscape, is, is the complexity of, of the National Park. And, I, and this complexity is quite challenging when you're trying to deal with historic and natural environment. And this complexity manifests itself in three ways, I guess. The first is the complexity of the landscape itself, which reflects many periods, many environments, many underlying geologies, many um, other different issues. Um, another manifestation of this complexity is modern land use uh, and the often competing demands between different landowners and different land users, between environment and culture. Um, and then the third thing, I suppose, is the complexity of the mechanisms by which the landscape is managed. So different designations, triple SIs versus scheduled monuments, different authorities, different expectations, and so on. Now, Alan's already shown you this map, and it's very tiny here, so you, I'm not, it's, it's a map of geology. Um, and it shows the geopark as well. I won't read out the, the figures here, but, I mean, the key thing, I suppose, is that the, the creation of national parks in the post-war period took place when our understanding of landscape was quite different to how we understand landscape today. And, in fact, indeed, the idea of a national park comes really from the American concept of, of wilderness, um, which emerged in the sort of romanticism of the late 19th century and then through photographers such as Ansel Adams and the Yosemite National Park and all that sort of thing. And of course, the idea of wilderness is a flawed concept because, you know, these places aren't wildernesses. People did live there. They just were not in the view of the people who were creating them as national parks. Um, but it, this idea of wilderness is a very powerful and influential one. And still a lot of visitors to the Brecon Beacons today think in terms of that wilderness kind of idea of it's an open, empty space of natural, um, undisturbed environment. Of course, we know that this is a historic landscape as much as it is any, any sort of natural landscape. And so transplanting this concept of wilderness from an American to a UK context, a more densely populated and complex palimpsest of landscape, was, has always been slightly challenging. And the other key thing to mention um, is that the national parks in the UK, and that includes obviously Brecon Beacons particularly, they're working and living landscapes. People live in them and they, they do stuff in them. They're not you know, preserved in the same way that, that they are in other parts of the world. A couple of key things to come out of this slide. There is actually quite a relatively high proportion of land in the Brecon Beacons National Park in public ownership. Um, about 15% of that is owned by the authority itself, and another 20% is owned by other public bodies. So there's real potential there for the National Park Authority and its partners to make a real difference in how that, how that land is managed. And the other point to make is, you can't really see it on the map because the map's too small, um, there is a population in the park of about 33, 34,000, as it says there. But of course, as Alan pointed out earlier, around the park there is particularly on the southern side, there is an enormous, a huge concentration of, of population of often quite disadvantaged and, and difficult to, to engage with communities and within a very short distance. Um, and I think they're important um, park users and potential park users as well. So the other aspect, of course, the historic environment in the park is not overlooked, it is well understood and has been an important consideration in the development and management of the park since the 1950s. And in fact, indeed, the, the historic environment is a key element of the special qualities of the National Park. And it has an essential role to play in ensuring a sustainable 
future for this protected landscape. And heritage gives the park its particular character. And heritage is significant, not just for its own value, but to what it can contribute to society more broadly. But there are potential threats to be managed, and it's that management that needs to be strategic and long-term, and that brings us to this Historic Environment Action Plan. Now, one of the reasons to think about why we need action in the Historic Environment are these State of the Park reports, which have been produced over the last few years, one in 2014, the most recent one in 2020. It looks at a wide range of indicators. You can't see any of these images here. Um, but the one here is, is nature and climate. In the middle, you've got people and the economy. And then on the right-hand side, you've got culture and heritage. Looking at a whole range of different variables, how you measure the well-being, if you like, of these different elements of what creates the national park landscape. Um, but of course, there are problems with the consistency of the baseline that we're measuring from and the data sets that we're using to measure improvement or decline and variation between these different types of measurement and, and across time and measuring the change in the impacts that, that take place. So one of the reasons, one of the ways of addressing this has always been through management plans and the National Park has um, always featured the historic environment in its management planning, although it's perhaps not always been expressed as the historic environment because of the way that ideas about that have shifted over time. But interestingly, if you look at the 2000 um, management plan, which is on the left here, um, there are 14 key themes in that document. Seven of them are all about historic environment. There's listed buildings or um, historic landscapes or archaeology or whatever it is, cultural heritage. You know, it's all there. It's, it just isn't tied together in, in quite the same way. But as they've gone on, these management plans have become more holistic and also more concerned with wider social issues, uh, such as access, well-being, and economic development. And as you see, there was a need uh, in 2020 to create a new management plan, and for a variety of reasons, that didn't happen straight away. Um, but the process is now well and truly underway, and that process of creating a new uh, management plan provided the impetus for the creation of of the Historic Environment Action Plan, or the HEAP. Um, so the Historic Environment Action Plan creation takes place within the context of the broader development of the management plan. Unfortunately, you can't see that either. But this shows some of the drivers for um, the external policy drivers, really, for developing the, the management plan. So there are management principles that are enshrined in all 12 uh, UK national parks. Um, there are um, a variety of um, social and economic goals as well. And it's all about policy focus being very much on maintaining and enhancing environmental and social values. National parks need to be safe and accessible, as well as being resilient ecosystems and resilient cultural ecosystems. And, you know, in the bottom left-hand corner, which you can't see at all, uh, Welsh government policy talks about, you know, valued places, resilient environments, resilient communities, and resilient ways of working. And all of this, of course, comes from the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which has its seven wellbeing goals, prosperous Wales, resilient, healthier, more equal Wales, a Wales of cohesive communities, a Wales of vibrant culture and language, and a globally responsible Wales. And of course, all of these, you know, speak directly to what we should be doing with our national parks and with our landscapes more generally. And also within the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act are the five ways of working and thinking. So to think long-term, to think about integration, involvement, collaboration, and prevention. Again, really important um, key strategic drivers. And then finally, there is the, the, the BBNP vision. Um, and it's to develop a, a rich and resilient landscape which helps communities to live prosperously and sustainably now and in the future. That is the Brecon Beacons National Park vision. Um, and it's, there are three objectives to try and do that. Landscape and nature recovery, community and rural enterprise, and inspiring people and places. And the historic environment has been put into this area of inspiring people and places. But actually, as we've argued throughout the creation of the action plan, the historic environment is an essential component across all three objectives. So that diagram there on the left, a plan of plans, essentially. That is the philosophy behind the 
new Brecon Beacons management plan. And the historic environment is, is here on the left. And there are all sorts of other um, plans to do with the natural environment, rights of way, um, rural economy, um, equality, diversity, and so on and so forth, which are all part of that, all part of that plan. And there are these cross-cutting themes, which again relate back to the well-being of future generations. So that's some of the sort of background, context, and policy background, if you like, to the development of the action plan. Now talk a little bit about the, the process. Um, so the Historic Environment Action Plan is the, is the child, really, of the Historic Environment Partnership, which is a wider group of people who represent um, businesses, uh, residents, public bodies, members of the National Park, landowners, and so on and so forth. Um, and there was a, a meeting quite early on in this process of everybody who was invited to come and say, say their thing. Um, and from that emerged the Historic Environment Partnership core group to take um, the action plan forward. And this was, again, representing all of these wide interests, but was inevitably focused, excuse me, on some core expertise. And for better or for worse, um, the Historic Environment Partnership core group uh, was chaired by me. <laughs> but it does involve all of these, all of these organisations are represented Okay, and you probably, again, may not be able to see all those logos, but there's myself representing all three uh, Welsh Archaeological Trusts who have a, a territory in the, in the National Park. Um, Young Archaeologists Club, National Trust, CADU, Royal Commission are there. Um, but then some uh, non-authority type voices as well. Um, so the Brecon Story, which is looking at sort of cultural heritage and some of the narratives around intangible heritage, um, the Brecknock Society Museum Friends, of course, and uh, the Friends of the Brecon Beacons, the Brecon Beacon Society, all represented around the table. Um, and although this discussion is facilitated by Brecon Beacons National Park Authority, and it has those voices of authority like Cadu and the Royal Commission and even the Welsh Trusts around the table, in fact, it's those... Uh, other voices that are, that are speaking and, and leading the discussion very, very much. Um, and here is a picture of one of those discussions. Uh, this, is, this is meeting number three. We're now on meeting number 13. Um, and we might look slightly less, less cheerful, a bit more jaded when we're sit, sitting around the, the team's table. But um, so all, a lot of this process has been online. And actually, if it hadn't been for that shift to online working, we probably wouldn't have made as much progress as we, as we have. Um, but you can see some of the some of the people that are represented there. Um, so we looked earlier at the general drivers for the National Park Management Plan, and you know some of the more specific drivers for the action the historic environment action plan process um, include things like the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, but also Planning Policy Wales, Historic Environment Wales Act, um, CADU guidance on, on conservation management, conservation principles, historic environment priorities, um, which is a government policy document, um, and supplementary planning guidance and all these, all, these other, all these other legislative policy and practice considerations that we needed to take account of. So that's the process, I suppose, and early on in the process we identified our purpose, um, or the purpose of the Historic Environment Action Plan, to promote the conservation, enhancement, celebration and shared understanding of the historic environment for the benefit of current and future generations. And then we also identified our goals to define a suite of shared objectives and secure commitment to delivering them, to ensure that the historic environment is managed in line with the best principles of conservation management, uh, to engage with our communities and with visitors in promoting the understanding of the historic environment and cultural heritage of the park, and to improve collaboration, resourcing, and capacity to support projects to enhance, research, monitor, and celebrate the beautiful and varied character of the historic environment and heritage of the park. So those are our goals, um, which we arrived at fairly easily. The more challenging bit was to actually turn that into an action plan, and the next challenging bit is to actually do the action. But I'll talk to you about the plan bit. So the outcomes from the conversations that we've had um, 
we were able to translate those goals and that vision into four fairly clear objectives, um, fairly broad objectives, but they each contain um, one or more um, or several narrower objectives or more focused objectives, and within those objectives are specific actions. And all of these actions are smart, so they're specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time Bound. And we've set ourselves um, particular targets and particular measures and particular indicators by which we would judge success on this. And some of these actions stretch across more than one objective and sometimes in more than one area. Now, I won't go into great... Well, I can go into as much detail as you like, but um, I'll go through these broad objectives. So... Under collaboration and partnership, there is only one objective, which is to promote and support collaboration. But obviously, there are several key actions un under that, which talk about um, integrating the action plan into partner policies and projects, so that everyone's kind of working towards the same aim. Um, and improving capacity to help coordinate the development of the action plan and the delivery of it. Because, again, this is a partnership project. So although it's, uh, the action plan is kind of owned by the... National Park, it's kind of owned by the Historic Environment Partnership and by the partners in that partnership. And that includes us, the Welsh Archaeological Trust, and it includes CADU, it includes Royal Commission, it includes all these other organisations. And the idea is to try and facilitate closer working together to try and build a, a, a critical mass that we can't achieve on our, on our own individually. Um, and then there are some specific things like having a particular day schools or, or developing an online presence as well. Um, probably the biggest area of action is the conservation management side. So we've got three um, key objectives here. You know, sustainable management, um, interaction between, between cultural and natural e ecosystems and contributing to green recovery objectives, and the protection, conservation, enhancement of um, significant assets. So there are actually 13 actions under these three objectives. Um, some of which are sort of systemic actions, so you know, looking at the planning system and how that works and how we can cooperate more effectively to deliver some planning outcomes. Some of the work that Zoe's been talking about earlier kind of contributes to that in a sense. It's, it's that information base that we need. Um, also looking at non-planning work, you know, historic environment input into, into other broader projects. Um, in terms of cultural natural ecosystems and green recovery work, um, a lot of that's around raising awareness of information and good practice, you know, woodlands, rivers, peatland restorations, um, agri-environment, and so on. A lot of us are working in our own little silos or bubbles, um, not necessarily aware of what other disciplines are doing or can contribute to our own work and our own understanding. And just breaking down some of those barriers between those silos and getting people to talk to each other as part of a, a partnership. And again, I think we've you know, in the Welsh Trusts have experienced the, the value of doing that in our um, memorandum of understanding we've got with NRW and the work that we've done with the Welsh Permits Agency in terms of agri-environment work. But broadening that out um, uh, across all the work that's going on in the National Park. Um, and trying to develop also a, kind of an ecosystem services type approach to cultural heritage. So looking at trying to develop a cultural ecosystem services kind of review of um, the need to take things, things forward. Um, and also, of course, you know, conserving and enhancing nationally significant assets, but also thinking about the ones that aren't um, scheduled or formally protected, um, and thinking about settings, historic townscapes, and so on as well. Um, valuing and celebrating, three objectives concerned with valuing and celebrating our heritage and historic environment, Four actions here. Again, a lot of it's about communication at this stage um, and capacity building to try and support volunteer and community development and appreciation and to develop, you know, those sorts of things in a strategic way so that we're not, you know, there, there is a pool of people <coughs> who are potential volunteers um, for, for us but also who might do work for um, the River Trusts or who might do work for other organisations, people in the National Park Society and so on and so forth. Um, and it's just making those networks and links and connections. And then finally, there are three 
um, objectives around improving and enhancing knowledge and understanding of the historic environment. And there are nine underlying actions here, um, which include, again, skills training, um, partnership working, closer um, cooperation, and so on and so forth. But some very specific um, <coughs> and tangible things. So we've identified the need for there to be a, a heritage crime uh, action, so to try and work towards actually a specific post within the National Park to tackle heritage crime. Um, I mentioned earlier the sort of cultural ecosystems kind of services review, but also actually to do a baseline study of the state of heritage. There are lots of different people measuring the condition of different things. Cadu bonus are scheduled monuments, but there's lots of other heritage assets that aren't necessarily being monitored or are being monitored in a different way. And it's trying to understand where we sit now, where the condition of the National Park's historic environment assets is, and therefore how we can measure change going forward. So when we look back in five years' time and say, well, we've had an action plan, we've done action, how has that actually been successful in helping the historic environment? We can say, well, the the number of monuments in condition A has gone from 10% to 90%, or whatever it happens to be. But we need to have that measurable baseline um, to do that. So there is an ambitious set of actions there, all of which can only be achieved through partnership working. I've, I've run through those very quickly, um, but I can, I can show you the, the links to, to look at this in draft form. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they're all smart objectives, smart actions, um, and there is some overlap. And I think we have... I mean, it's quite interesting reading through this in the last few days to prepare this talk, because I've had some distance from it in, in the last month or so and had my mind very much somewhere else. But to come back to it, actually, it, it stands up, and I'm very pleased that, it, that, it, that it, it does, actually. And I think we've struck a good balance between ambition and, and pragmatism and pragmatic delivery. So just very quickly to end by looking at the future... <clears throat> First, we've got to complete the plan, uh, which is at a consultation phase, and then integrate that with the rest of the National Park Management Plan, have that adopted, signed off by members, signed off by Welsh Government, and move forward. And we need to make sure, as part of that work, that the historic environment is contained within the other plans in that plan of plans approach, and across those three broad areas in the, in the vision for the National Park, landscape, community, and, and inspiring people and places. But the key thing is... <coughs> Pardon me. The plan itself is only a blueprint for action. So change and improvement is only possible if we understand the baseline condition, where we are now, and we've identified some funding to, to take that work forward, as I've said. And this will give us the key evidence base from which to launch some of the more ambitious elements of the plan in the future. And, and it's really important to remember we can only do this through partnership working and through genuine collaboration and cooperation both within the historic environment sector and beyond it. And I think the historic environment partnership core group has made a really positive start on this. And there is a sense of optimism that our message on the historic environment is being understood across all areas of the national park activities. And it does go back to the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, really, making sustainable decisions to make the world a better place for future generations. So on that note, I would just like to thank my... Um, colleagues on the HEP core group, I mean, I, I chair the meetings, but I don't really do anything. Most of the work is led by Alice Thorne and her team at the National Park. Uh, Sophie Jones is a special credit because she's been organising, coordinating, she's the secretariat of this group, she does all the work, fundamentally, um, to get us together and to coordinate these meetings and takes the minutes and make sure we do our actions. And these people are often undersung, I think. And then also you can see the names there and the, and the organisations they represented. So thanks to them and thanks to you for listening. So thank you. <laughs>